Um, I have a lot of content to get through. I want to make sure there's time. So my name is Noah Eisen. Um, I'm an engineer on the gRPC team. Uh, I've been working there for about two and a half years now with a focus on C++. And uh, for the past year and a half, I've been focusing on performance. Uh, so this talk is on gRPC performance. Uh, we're going to talk about tuning both libraries, like the internals of the gRPC library, and also tuning applications that use gRPC. Um, so before we get further into this, I want to talk about intended audience. Uh, it's really meant for anyone who has an interest in performance. Um, the examples are going to come from gRPC library and gRPC applications, uh, but all of the concepts are very high level, uh, and so they should be interesting to anyone who has worked with performance who, or who cares about performance. Uh, so I want to talk, and also on the slide, I don't have it in text, but I kind of want to talk about like goals of this presentation. Um, like definitely some general, not gRPC specific um, ideas about performance best practices is something I want people to walk away with. And then also near the end, I kind of want this to become a way that people are more comfortable starting conversations about like maybe specifically gRPC performance, like how to open a GitHub issue and what kind of information to put in there that would make it more actionable from our end. Okay, so I'll start with the gRPC overview uh, in case people aren't as familiar with gRPC. I want to do a quick show of hands. Um, how many people have heard of gRPC? Okay, cool. So I figured, how many people have actually written gRPC code? And among that, um, who has worked with the Java stack? Okay, how about the Go stack? And then how about the C++ or wrapped language stack? Okay, fewer. Cool, cool. Um, okay, so I'll do an overview of uh, gRPC, and then uh, I'm going to talk about kind of like the crux of this pr presentation, which is tooling, benchmarks, and data. Um, I'm going to keep coming back to those three words. You're going to hear them again and again and again applied throughout the talk in different ways. Um, so then we're going to go through some examples in the gRPC library itself, um, and then near the end we'll talk about gRPC applications, and again, apply those same concepts. So <clears throat> starting with the gRPC overview. Um, Google has this rich history of taking the awesome technology internally and making it available to the open source. Uh, so at Google internally, there's a container management system called Borg. Uh, that was open source's Kubernetes. I assume most people are familiar with that because we're at KubeCon. Uh, Similarly, the internal build system at Google is called Blaze. Uh, that was open sourced as Bazel recently. TensorFlow, the machine learning library, exists uh, internally at Google, and it was also made available to the open source community. And then lastly, uh, the internal RPC solution for Google was Stubby, uh, but Google is replacing it with gRPC, which is built in the open source, and uh, currently migrating internal use cases to use gRPC more and more. Uh, so that's kind of like the origins and history of gRPC, in case you weren't familiar. Um, gRPC stands for gRPC Remote Procedure Call. Uh, it's a recursive definition, I promise. Um, <laughs> gRPC is a high-performance, open-source, standards-based, uh, general-purpose, polyglot, feature-rich RPC framework. Um, each of those bullet points could deserve an hour-long talk by itself. Um, I've taken the high-performance one and put it in bold because that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, and it's actively developed. There's a big team at Google that is working on it, and some open source contributors. We'd love more, but there are definitely some. And uh, it is production ready today. So that's the brief overview of gRPC. Um, a generic stack for gRPC looks kind of like this. There at the top in the green, you have a user application. Uh, that's the code that is actually calling to the gRPC APIs. So we don't own that. Um, the first entry point into our library is a layer of generated code, uh, and that is API-specific. So you feed some generating process a proto file, which has your service definitions, and it will spin up that generated code layer. Uh, the generated code is then going to hook into the core library. That's where the main functionality and main features are implemented. And then somewhere lower down at the bottom is a transport, and this is a library or a set of system calls that knows how to put bytes onto a wire. Um, and this is going to look different from stack to stack, so I'm going to briefly run through each of our language stacks because we have three separate language stacks. Um, first off, Go. Um, I just wanted to call out some differences in the bottom. Uh, they, in some ways, depend on the XNet HTTP2 library. This is mo mostly for H2 framing. Uh, 
uh, and then on the bottom they will be calling to TCP. Um, Java stack, also the main differences to call out are in the transport. Um, near the bottom, Java depends on two libraries, Nete and OKHttp. Uh, OKHttp is used for mobile clients. Uh, Java also has a completely gRPC-owned in-process transport to work in a case where uh, you have gRPC in the same process. The C++ stack looks a little bit different. Um, so starting from the bottom and going up, um, at the bottom is also TCP, but uh, the C library has implemented its own HTTP implementation. Um, that's called CHTTP. That allows us to write an H2 implementation that uses gRPC data structures, and we can more heavily optimize it because it's more of our own code. We can move faster. Um, above that, there's the gRPC core. Again, that's the bulk of the functionality. Um, on top of the core is a thin C surface, and the C surface is what supports our wrapped languages. So above that, you can see Python, Ruby. There's also Node, Objective-C, PHP. Anything that wasn't mentioned before is supported by our, our C surface. And then that kind of allows the wrap languages to share most of the functionality, and we implement it in core, and they, they just get that feature for free. Uh, and then above that is, of course, layer of generated code. OK, that's it for the overview. I want to talk about the key points. As I mentioned, tooling, benchmarks, and data. These are the points we're going to keep coming back to. And if there's three words that you remember walking out of this, it should be tooling, benchmarks, and data. Uh, and you'll hear them a lot. So starting with tooling, um, in order to optimize code, you need to know where to look. I have confused Jackie Chan asking, where are my microseconds going? Uh, if you don't know, you cannot possibly start to perform optimizations. Um, and so in my mind, tooling kind of narrows the problem scope. So tooling narrows. I know that's kind of cryptic. We'll get back to what, that, what exactly I mean by that. Uh, and the last thing I want to call out before I dive even deeper into tooling is that it's important that there is no, there's no perfect tool. There's no one tool that's going to show all the hotspots to optimize, all the places where your code is slow. Um, there's no one tool to rule them all or something, uh, which is why it's important to use many tools, and we'll talk about that. So diving into a few important kinds of tooling that have been very important, important to gRPC, um, I want to start with latency traces. So uh, just another like show of hands kind of thing. Who here has used a tracing system? This could be like distributed tracing or just in process. OK, cool. So experience. Yeah, so then this might look very familiar. Tracing involves adding annotations directly to the code. Uh, gRPC has our own timer system that does tracing. Uh, so you, as you can see, that's actually what it looks like, GPR timer scope, and you give it a string value. Um, and what that'll do, it'll log a timestamp and that string, uh, and it'll allow for some post-processing. So at the simplest form, this could actually just be writing to a log file and then have a post-processor that reads in the timestamps. Uh, it could get a little more fancy. Uh, these annotations could instead write to some in-memory data structure. Um, if you want less overhead, um, but anything. Latency tracing maintains ordering and gives you kind of a this happens and this happens and this happens view of your code, and that's a great way to show hotspots. Um, on the left, I have actually a screenshot of some internal visualization tool, uh, and as you can see with an arrow, uh, this is just capturing kind of all the things that happen before we actually go to the send message syscall. Um, and I've linked to our gRPC implementation of these timers uh, in, in our GitHub repo if anyone's curious. Um, <clears throat> but, as I mentioned, uh, there's no perfect tool. And tracing has its strengths and it has its weaknesses. And it's important to understand those to use it more, most effectively. So for tracing, um, one of the biggest weaknesses is that the tracing system itself can add a lot of overhead. They tend to be more of a heavyweight tool. So trusting benchmark numbers that come when tracing enabled might not be a great idea. Uh, sometimes what we'll do is we'll, use, we'll enable tracing to get a graph like that, but then to get actual absolute numbers, disable the tracing. Um, also, tracing works very well in low thread environments. Uh, if multiple threads are happening at once, tracing can get a little messier. Uh, this comes from a very single threaded uh, benchmark we have. So tracing in itself is not enough. Um, another tool that gRPC has focused on, uh, CPU profiling. Again, kind of show of hands, like who here is familiar with profiling or has like looked at Charts like this, okay, yeah, I figured this would be a little more popular. Um, so this is a flame graph, uh, again, taken of a real gRPC benchmark. Uh, again, you can kind of see that send message up in the top, uh, which is taking a large chunk of time, which is good. If, if we could make all of, you know, the more time that's spent in the actual syscall, the better, the less overhead that's happening in the gRPC library. Um, profiling, like any tool, will have its strengths and have its weaknesses. 
Um, so like a strength of profiling would be uh, you don't actually need to go and annotate your code. Profiling kind of works for free out of the box. Uh, the kernel is actually you know, asking each core 400 times a second or some frequency what function is running on you right now. It'll amalgamate that data and generate this chart. Um, so if a function is hot, it will show up in a, in a profile, which is great, because it can kind of be the fastest way forward and fastest tool to get started on. And it also tends to be pretty low overhead, uh, depending on like, with what frequency it's profiling. Um, but again, um, every tool has weaknesses. If a thread is sleeping, it's not running, on a, not running a core, it won't be profiled. So CPU profiling, not really a strong tool to show contention problems, because in that case, you'll have threads waiting, but they won't actually be showing that up here. Um, so lastly, I also wanted to call out um, some other tools that are worth mentioning. Um, lock contention measuring tools, just mentioned hard to do lock contention with profiling, so Valgrind, Mutrace, things like that. Um, GRPC has also had very good luck with custom counter code. So we've implemented some infrastructure in our library that will actually, in a certain kind of build, hook into the allocation system, the atomic system, uh, and run counters, and then log that information. So we can actually have benchmarks that start tracking allocation counts, and we can see if those change. Uh, and that's really great. And kind of reducing any of those is always going to be a good idea. And then generally other kernel tools can always be useful, like perf, of course, and strace for looking at system calls. And uh, poke a hole is a new one we're kind of exploring with that shows you more efficient C++ struct packing. Um, so that, that's a new one. But the bottom line about tooling is uh, that it's, you need to obtain an arsenal of tools. And then that's not enough, because that arsenal needs to continuously grow. And people should be experimenting with new tools, trying to figure out what's cool, how can we look at our stack in another way, uh, and then use tools together. Where one is weak, use another one. Where one is strong, focus on its strengths. Uh, and, and that really gives like, a performance team a great sense of where the time is being spent, where the microseconds are going. <clears throat> so that's tooling. Let's move on to benchmarks. So in order to optimize, you need to know how to measure. Uh, so now I have confused Fry asking, was that really an optimization? I'm not sure. Like, I think it was faster. But I mean, if you can't prove it, uh, it's a little bit harder to say. Uh, so benchmarks, then, where tooling narrows scope, I kind of see it as benchmarks widen scope of impact. And again, I'll get back to that and make that a little more clear with some other diagrams. Um, like tooling, benchmarks come with many different kinds. So uh, micro benchmarks. Um, raise your hand if you have written a micro benchmark in any language with. OK, fewer. Um, so micro benchmarks are awesome. Uh, they're great for narrow scope optimizations. Uh, so this is a real snippet of, from our GRPC code base. It's benchmarking error creation. Uh, GRPC C core has a struct that represents error and status. And in this tight loop, it's going to create it and then delete it. Um, and that's going to run something like 5.5 5 .5 million times, I think I see. Yeah, 5.5 .5 million times until the benchmarking system gets a good sense of how long that operation took. And it'll output data. So it's telling us that creating and deleting an error is about 120 nanoseconds. Um, and microbenchmarks are awesome in a very narrow, specific use case. They can show changes to small subcomponents of your code. Um, but this is, again, a point that I'm going to circle back on and back on. All of these kinds of tools have their strengths and have their weaknesses. And so microbenchmarks have the weakness of being narrow in scope. Um, when in a program would it ever be realistic to create 5.5 million errors and then delete them immediately? Like, never. So it's going to show pretty unrealistic cache behavior. Behavior You're not going to see multi-threaded scenarios working well. So microbenchmarks are good for showing directional changes of subcomponents. As far as looking at absolute numbers for microbenchmarks, probably not as useful. Uh, but uh, to, show, you know, to show an optimization for something, some tight module, they're great. So another kind of benchmark that we've focused on <clears throat> is synthetic benchmarks. And what I mean by synthetic benchmarks is anything that is written above the API. So this is a program, and for gRPC's use case, this is a program that uses the gRPC library, does some amount of work, and then outputs some data about that work. Um, so I've thrown up an example of gRPC's synthetic benchmarking system, which is 
highly configurable. Uh, it involves a driver sending out configuration files to a client and server, and then the client and server will talk to each other with some configuration of messages, and then output data about the latency and the RPC counts. Um, and then for our example, our configuration file looks like that on the right. Uh, it is very configurable. You can configure the number of servers, the number of server threads, number of clients, request response size. Um, and that is very useful for us to kind of experiment with a wide array of RPC topographies. And maybe we have a problem when there's very large messages with only one client and one server. Maybe it's when there's five clients and five servers and uneven messages, small requests, large response. It's completely configurable, and this has been awesome. But I want to make a point about this, that this is just an example of our synthetic benchmarking system. Uh, it's not the synthetic benchmarking system. So another example of a synthetic benchmark might be if you were to write a server and a client, and the client does some fixed amount of work, like 1,000 RPCs, and you just use time, like the, the system call time on it to see how long that takes. That's also an example of a synthetic benchmark. Is anything written above the API that's doing work for the sole purpose of benchmarking, for the sole purpose of timing it or getting counts. Um, and I want to talk about one more benchmark type, and that's application benchmarks. And this is kind of a subtle differentiation, so I want to talk about this. Because uh, benchmarking applica application benchmarks are also synthetic benchmarks, but the difference in my mind is that these are written with another team's API. Uh, so this is going to exercise your stack in a new way. It's actually going to exercise your stack in the exact way that this other team exercises your stack. So to make this more clear, the example is uh, TensorFlow's RPC bench. Also, yeah, side note, this only applies to libraries uh, because like, if you're not a library, no one will probably be using your API, so just asterisk there. But um, the example that I chose is uh, TensorFlow's RPC bench. This is a benchmark written via TensorFlow APIs. Uh, but it's written in a way that it's, it's very RPC intensive. Uh, so I kind of like drew up a little bit of the configuration. It has 30 workers. One of them starts it, sends an RPC to all the other ones. They all talk to the other ones in one full mesh step, and then all the results come back to the first worker. Um, and all of the actual TensorFlow work doing, that it's doing is pretty lightweight. This, this stresses the RPC system heavily. Uh, and so they created this benchmark, and we, we found it. And this was so useful to us because <clears throat> it exercised our stack in a new way with more of a realistic RPC topography for TensorFlow. So that's, that's application benchmarks. Lastly, data. So we talked about tooling. We've talked about benchmarks. Um, I want to talk about data. Um, and this kind of comes with a little bit of a backstory. So there was a time in the gRPC performance effort where we had a lot of engineers working on it, bringing numbers to the table with various benchmarks, various environments, and it was a lot of motion, but it was kind of hard to equate that motion with actual progress. Uh, and so this is kind of a point about the performance team needing kind of a shared language, needing a lingua franca with which to talk about optimizations. Uh, and I mean this both in terms of tooling and benchmarks. So like being familiar with the same sets of tools, being used to looking at the same diagrams, and also kind of knowing which benchmarks we focus on, what the average numbers might look like from certain benchmarks, um, once everyone is kind of standardized on that, talking about performance optimizations becomes much cleaner and much clearer. Um, the, uh, the clip art I have here I heard was kind of opaque. That's the Tower of Babel, but kind of signifying that if like, all your engineers are speaking different languages about like, different numbers and different metrics, it's impossible to make progress. So that's the data point. Okay, 18 minutes. So uh, another one of my crappy diagrams, uh, this is back to tooling narrows the scope of the problem until it becomes manageable to solve, and then benchmarking widens the scope to demonstrate the impacts. And then all this together gets packaged up as data, as a way to like, discuss and talk about and show optimizations. And I'll come back to this in a case study, which will hopefully make it more clear. OK, so those were kind of the high-level, general, library, application agnostic points. Um, don't worry, you'll hear them again. They're coming back. They, they will be in this section and the next section as well. But those were uh, this kind of the crux of this talk. Uh, so now we're going to dive into the gRPC library, talk about some specific examples from there. Um, <clears throat> And uh, before I even get into the text of this slide, I, I kind of want to make a point of the, these, these three principles, uh, tooling, benchmarks, and data, are awesome to have. And it would be so great if, when you started the project, your tooling and benchmarks were in a perfect place and they were, they were amazing. But realistically, that's not how it happens. 
things need to get built, they need to get built fast. Uh, and realistically, your benchmarking system will come up a little bit later than the actual core functionality. Uh, GRPC found this to be the case, uh, and there were some things that you know, were known to be slow. We went in, we fixed them. We got all the low-hanging fruit off the table. And then it came time to say, OK, well, where is the next big spot for optimization? And there wasn't really a clear answer. Um, and at the same time, there's three kind of important facts I want to call out. And that's features can cause small regressions. Um, and these small regressions might be below your margin of detection. And I have that italicized because I want to talk about what that means, below margin of detection. Um, if you have no benchmarking system that can detect regressions, then by definition, every regression is below the margin of detection. Uh, or if your benchmarking system is in place, but it doesn't have coverage, uh, maybe you have rich benchmarks on insecure scenarios, but then a regression slips into a secure pathway. Like, that's missed. Or if the benchmark is noisy uh, and it can't catch regressions, then that's another way that these regressions can like, slip into the code base. Regardless, the result is consistent slow degradation of performance. Um, and so at this point, kind of in the GRPC history, we asked ourselves the question of how do we reverse this process? Um, the answer, of course, was like better benchmarks, better tooling, more data. So we focused on a new benchmark. We called it the minimal RPC. This was a specific scenario of our synthetic system, with that highly configurable system. So we configured it to ping pong back and forth, one byte payloads, very small. Uh, we did no security, and we did no stats or tracing. And then we started focusing on the median latency between two computers running in the same rack. And we knew this number was about 70 microseconds. And everyone on the team knew this number. Uh, and we could start iterating on this number and demonstrating change using this scenario and looking at data coming from this scenario. At the same time, we, we, uh, we reached out and we found new tools. Um, and we also, this is a little bit I haven't mentioned before, but uh, we had to do an effort to reduce our noise. And this was just a, a case of throwing more resources at the problem. Uh, a noisy scenario was running a two-minute benchmark. Uh, we ran that two-minute benchmark 30 times and then took the median. So throw some resources at it, get the noise down, and then you have a finer granularity with which to measure changes. So I'm going to run through a quick case study. Uh, this was from a latency trace. This is the uh, visualization tool I showed earlier. Uh, we would kind of look at chunks of time together and ask ourselves, is anything surprising or taking more time than we think it should? So in this case, we looked at this ACL filter. It was just doing an access control check on an outbound RPC, uh, and it was taking about a microsecond, you can see from here. So that seemed a little bit sketchy. Um, the next step, of course, is to go to another tool. So this is a flame graph kind of narrowed in. Um, I'm going to zoom it in one further. So take a second to look at that top layer and like see if you can see any things that look kind of uh, out of place. There's, there's like three really good answers here, actually. There's a, there's a lot of things going on. So I'm going to pause for like two, two more seconds. Oh, no, I'm not going to pause. I have to keep going. OK. Uh, firstly, there's, do a, there's, a, there's a flag read going on. Um, and it's not just any flag read. It's, it's actually a very long flag read. It's taking a long time. Um, and this is all happening in the, the per RPC hot path. So, this is kind of sketchy because flag reads probably aren't going to change over the life of the binary. This is something that could be cached somewhere. Um, other good answers would be all the string manipulation stuff going on over here. Uh, again, probably not needed for uh, something to like, happen every time the RPC goes through. And there's a mutex. And that one, I mean, maybe could be replaced with atomics, but that's a little bit. But mainly it was the flag read. This was a quick, a quick fix. We saw this data. We went to the code. We saw the problem, cached the flag reduce the overhead. So this was a good, a good story for that. And so now I want to take that crappy diagram again with some examples, and I think it'll be more clear. But we started with a very wide problem. Optimize gRPC. Make gRPC faster. That is so wide in scope that it's almost impossible to give to an engineer, and they'll do it. So then we used the tooling, and we got that a little bit more narrow in scope. So then it became, OK, optimize just the ACL filter. Like Figure out why it's slow and optimize it. And then again, with some more tooling, uh, that was narrowed even further. So then the problem spoke became remove the per RPC flag read in the ACL filter. And that is a very actionable like, problem set to give to an engineer who can execute on that in a week or so. At that point, once the optimization is in place, uh, it comes time to show the impact. Um, and so this can start with microbenchmarks, which are narrow, and say, hey, this one operation of this one filter was at this number, now it's at this number, 
That's great. And then the next question is, okay, did this impact our synthetic benchmarks? Did this impact an actual scenario using the gRPC API? And then to get even wider, did this impact applications using gRPC? And all that comes together packaged with the data and the code change. And that, that becomes a very clear, consistent story for progressing and making optimizations to the code base. So the last point I want to make um, in this section on breaking down the layer, uh, in uh, the section on uh, tuning libraries, is breaking down the layers. Uh, and so this means never thinking that you've hit like the bottom point of what you can do when you hit the bottom layer of your API. Um, so the Java team has made a lot of contributions to Netty and OKHTTP because they sit atop that library, overhead in that library will be a, it's attributed to the RPC layer, uh, and if there's things that can be faster between them, that's great. Similarly, Go has made some contributions to XNet HTTP library. And uh, in Google, the C team has worked extensively with Google's TCP team to tune some of the TCP options to make it more, uh, more optimized for the RPC use case. So uh, you can always go deeper. You can always go lower. Well, maybe not always, but you, you can definitely go lower, probably. Um, that's going deeper in the stack. Uh, you can also rise up and go higher in the stack. Um, that's going to be kind of the next part of this talk is tuning things uh, more in user land from the library perspective. <clears throat> so tuning gRPC applications, tuning applications that use gRPC. Uh, and uh, this part was a little impossible to keep language agnostic, so I have kind of a slide I'm going to run through that has uh, some language by language callouts. But to start with like the obvious thing, which is always good to start with the obvious, um, all language stacks are going to benefit from reducing allocations, reducing your copies, reducing syscalls, reducing contention. Um, how to figure out how to reduce those? Answer is probably tooling and benchmarks. Um, reducing allocations is going to be especially important for the Go stack and the Java stack um, because by nature of being garbage collected, they're going to be hurt way more by excessive allocations. Um, so specifically, I'm just going to run through each language stack, uh, but the Java stack uh, using the async API, tuning thread pools. Uh, Java stack has uh, some default thread pools, default unbounded thread pools. Uh, your use case might make it more optimal to use like a fork join pool or some fixed size pool. Um, also, tuning Netty direct memory. Uh, the Java library gives hooks to actually reach down into Netty and tune some of the things there. Uh, and the last point is maybe consider using Netty ePoll, which is supported by gRPC or, or uh, KQ. Not the, the out-of-the-box solution is, uses NIO. Um, and these are all things like quick things to try, things that uh, you know, aren't going to be always the right solution or else they would be the default. But if you have good benchmarks in place, trying them and then experimenting uh, is a good idea. For the C++ stack, um, this above all else, uh, use the async API, uh, which is way more highly tuned than our sync API. I don't have it in the text because it's pretty experimental, but there is a new callback-based API coming to C++. Um, it's, it's in the code base now. It needs more tuning, but that's like a, what kind of like what's next, look out for. Um, we've got a lot of feedback that our async API is not that easy to use, uh, and so this is kind of an effort to fix that and make it easier to write high-performance C++ gRPC applications. Uh, for C++, tuning the threading model and tuning the number of completion queues uh, is always going to be important, like based on how you're using the library. Um, so how many threads do you have driving the completion queues, calling cq.next, uh, and how many actually queues you have yourself, uh, and then how many outstanding RPCs can be in flight. Uh, that's also going to be specific to the application, but a number that can have a lot of impact on performance. Uh, for the Go stack, parallelizing with more Go routines, uh, while at the same time not creating unnecessary Go routines is going to be important. Um, tuning the read-write buffer size, and also number of outstanding RPCs. And of course, throw tooling, benchmarks, and data at these problems. Um, going to run through a case study from the application side now. So a distributed TensorFlow needs a network layer. This involves many TensorFlow processes running on different machines. Uh, in the open source, they use gRPC. Uh, at some point, it became a goal and a project to improve uh, TensorFlow over gRPC performance. This was kind of a cross-team effort between our team and their team. So the first step was to learn some of TensorFlow's tooling. This is some of the TensorFlow logging system, which is in their open source repo. Uh, and this is a visualization of that tooling. Uh, 
This is showing actual communication between two GPUs that are going to the network. Uh, the purple rectangles show RPCs that are happening, and we can see their length, and we can see that they're kind of stacking up on each other and uh, being very uneven. And this is like not really doesn't good. You kind of want to see consistent performance across pro program execution. Um, so with new tooling under our belt, the next step was to uh, go through some benchmarks. I already mentioned RPC Bench. Um, from our perspective, from gRPC Library's perspective, RPC Bench was an application benchmark because it was using the TensorFlow APIs, not gRPC's APIs. From TensorFlow's team, uh, the RPC Bench was a synthetic benchmark because this is a program that they've written with their own APIs for the purpose of benchmarking. So like what, what one team's application benchmark is, another team's synthetic benchmark is. Um, so we used that, but then we also went even higher and we, we used kind of what from TensorFlow's team would be an application layer benchmark. We, we used benchmarks that people had written using the TensorFlow APIs themselves. So this was real TensorFlow training tasks. Um, and I've kind of drawn out what the topography looks like there. They, they have N workers, maybe 300, maybe 500, and then some probably odd number of parameter servers. Um, and this should look familiar if anyone's, I don't know, familiar with the distributed TensorFlow model. Um, but this is different than RPC Bench, and this is good because it exercises things in different ways. Um, the parameter servers are going to be way more bottlenecked. And that was the case in certain cases, that the, that the parameter servers were kind of the slow point for this execution. Um, and so that needed some better threading uh, to support kind of like overloaded parameter servers, uh, and also putting serialization in a thread pool instead of the, the thread that was doing gRPC network work was very, and I've linked to those changes if you're curious. Um, but again, this is just about using new benchmarks that exercise the stack in new and different ways, in more realistic ways, uh, is always going to be a good thing. Um, one of the last points I want to make uh, is breaking down the layers again. From the application side, you can break down the layers and go lower by digging into the gRPC library. Uh, we're always happy for contributions that improve our performance. Uh, and by contributions, I, I don't just mean code contributions. Uh, this could also come in the form of very informative bug reports. Uh, but with those, focus on tooling and benchmarks. You know, a bug report that mentions gRPC performance not being up to par, uh, but it's not actionable, is not super helpful, but one that comes with, here's some tooling, here's some data, here's some diagrams we found, here's an exact benchmark that you can run on your machine, then it becomes something that like, we can engage with and, and, and it's actionable. And so, yeah, we love contributions from open source. That's all I have. Um, again, my name is Noah Eisen. Uh, links to gRPC code and to personal stuff are there. gRPC is hiring. If you're interested at all uh, in any of the language stacks, come talk to me. Uh, I have an email for you. And that's it. Open it up two minutes early for questions. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So the question was, have we ever run into a case where uh, observing the program caused a degradation in performance? Absolutely. That was, that was something that bit us with like, some tracing tools, which, like, as I mentioned, can have higher overhead. So some of these, yeah, some of these toolings, uh, if they're enabled, the actual performance numbers get way out of whack because they're maybe logging or they're writing some in-memory data structure, doing something slow. Yeah, definitely. And that's something, like, if it, try to understand if a tooling has that weakness and then just understand it and then it can still be useful. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, that's going to, I, so caveat, I'm not a Go expert. I'm uh, more of a C++ stack person. But um, I think that comes in using Go routines to parallelize more work. So maybe using a separate Go routine to do the serialization, whereas a separate, and then a different one to do the interaction with the gRPC API could be something you look into. Um, but yes, that is. I'm not totally sure, having not had too much familiarity with Go.
Mm -hmm. So, uh, spot check me here, but I think the answer is not yet. Um, right now, the traffic does go through a translation step. Um, I think eventually the goal of like, I mean, this was one of the goals of building JPC in the open source and using it internally, was for that communication to happen with less translation. Um, uh, I don't know right now if there's any like, com like direct communication JPC client outside of Google going to inside. Uh, but that is definitely like a goal of the use case, like that, yeah, to eliminate translation steps. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this, uh, I've got to read some, repeat some questions. But this was asking about struct packing. Um, yes, this is looking into kind of like the internal structs that the core uses, like to represent a transport, which are these huge, huge structs, and both doing better packing and also making sure that kind of like the hot, the hot items in that struct uh, occur at the beginning of the cache line, where it's going to be easier. Uh, and that also things that will be touched together appear in the same cache line. So like, you know, if we know that these four variables are used for compression, make sure that they're right next to each other so that gets pulled in at the same time. Yeah, stuff like that. That is a great question, and I, I have no idea. Yeah, I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Nothing that I know that's like a pre-existing solution for, but just, I mean, yeah, anything that is hitting a, hitting a server in a different way, yeah, anything configurable. <laughs> Um, so for the synthetic, oh, right, so subchannels. Uh, the question was for, yeah, I, I should keep remembering to repeat the question. The question was about the benchmarks. Uh, are they doing multiple subchannels or one subchannel poor top-level channel? For everything I've talked about, uh, there's nothing that involved actual load balancing. So like, we never involved the load balancing pathways of round robining over subchannels. Um, they were all doing one client channel equals one connection underlying. There are some cases where we're using multiple client channels, which each have their own connection under them. But no, that's a great point, and that's kind of, that is a missed coverage area right now for gRPC, is that uh, those hot paths of if a given client channel has 100 sub-channels, um, uh, we, we don't have many existing performance benchmarks over that. All right, I think that's also about it for our time, so thank you.